thank you. Thank you for life and for light. Thank you for the palpability of your presence. And thank you for the immutability of your counsel. Thank you for shining light on our path that we may not walk in darkness. Again tonight, we came, we came to receive, we came to minister unto you, and we came to be ministered to by you, that by the precious things that we cause that our hands will chance upon as we pick out of that brook that we might be able to confront the days that are ahead of us and that we might be able to post dividends back to heaven. We are grateful because much more you will do for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. In Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much, Apostle Mike. Um, thank you. Yes, if you wanted to clap, you are not out of order. You are not out of order at all. Thank you so very much for bringing that perspective. Uh, it, it sheds a, a lot of light on the things that the Lord has been motioning to me uh, concerning this evening's meeting. Uh, and um, that's the beauty of the Spirit. Yesterday we were trying to establish a few things as regards the year and the season. And then this morning, there was that uh, very intense prophetic buildup. And one of the things that is clear, if you followed carefully, if you followed carefully, is that one a season where there'll be very contrasting realities that might be experienced. It will be a season where some persons will be having the best times of their lives, and it would be a season when for some people it would be a day of gloom, of gloominess, a day of darkness, a day of chaos, and many people will be torturing on the edge of oblivion. Yet, it shall be like it was in the days of Israel in Egypt, that those that dwell in Goshen shall have the Lord for their light. And it shall be like the journeys of the Israelites in their pilgrimage through the wilderness, that the same pillar will administer light on the one side and it will be dark on the other side. In this day of the Lord, because the Lord himself is the one who comes into his temple to sit as a refiner, and he sits to refine the sons of Levi as silver and, of, and as gold. These are not days when deceptions would fly. One of the things that will happen is that the contrast, the difference, will become more and more glaring gradually as we advance through this year. Because this year is part of a season, like I said yesterday. Uh, it's not a standalone year. And for so many people, this year will be transitional for so many people. Uh, and so if you know how to build bridges in the spirit, this is the year to do them. Because the things that connect where you are coming from with where you are going to, they have to be put in place in this year. For so many people, this is going to be the transition, the beginning of a transitional period as we journey into very massive phases in our experience as God's corporate people. And... In the nations of the earth, there will be uh, so much of the shakings. I don't want to go through. It's very obvious that the things that we um, have been talking about since yesterday uh, is consistent with the things that the Lord said in the morning. And so I'm just going to try this evening to transition a little bit to the responsibility of God's people at such a time as this. And again tonight, I'm going to ask you to lend me your prophetic ears because 
the things that we will say by the grace of God uh, will not only bring perspective, but it will bring direction to uh, quite a couple of spirits that have come seeking the Lord for personal instruction and perspective and direction for the pilgrimage of their particular destinies. So, when God begins to talk about the shakings that was going to come, as at the point we closed yesterday in the progression of the narration that we saw that was incarnated in the life and ministry of Haggai, we noticed that when the Lord came, God said, those of you that saw the former temple in all of its glory, this current temple looks like nothing, right? And the obvious answer was yes, because that was a rhetorical question. But he told Israel, nevertheless, get on with the walk. Even though this thing you are building does not look like what the ancient men had seen before, get on with the work. He later gives us the secret behind such level of command. And he said it's because what Solomon built in the days of Solomon was prepared for by Solomon and his father before him. They were the ones who equipped and furnished the temple that they built. But what you will build, I will be the one to furnish it. This is going to be a major distinction between the temple of Solomon and this current temple. And there are layers to the workings of God. I hope that God gives me grace to be able to uh, bring this prophetic insight in the next, you know, uh, maybe 50 minutes because there's a lot of journeys to do tonight. But there's so much perspective that we need to bring in order to help you to labor, which is one of the examples that you see. Not just an example, it's the protocol of the book of Haggai. When Haggai gave the prophecy on the first day of the sixth month, and by the 24th day of that month, the work of the temple had begun. But one month into the building, the same people needed more word from the Lord. So Haggai came again on the 21st day of the seventh month to speak to the people that had just started working on the 24th day of the last month. So by the 21st day of the next month, Haggai was back to them and he was bringing them encouragement in the word of the Lord. Yesterday, I talked about the fact that some people jettisoned the position and the placement and relevance of the ministries that God set in the body with regards to transformation and nation building. And I said this because they haven't looked into the script sufficiently because you'd realize that according to the book of Ezra, I think it's Ezra chapter 4 verse 16. If you find it, put it on the screen. You'd notice that as I said yesterday, Ezra... Uh, Haggai and uh, Zechariah and Nehemiah, they all speak into the same project. It was, they are basically all about this building project that was to go on in Jerusalem. And so in Ezra chapter 4, um, I think it is in verse 16. Ezra chapter 4. Hmm, no, not. All right. Ezra chapter, is this 6 verse 14? All right. 6 verse 14. Okay, yeah. Ezra chapter 6 verse 14. The Bible says, and the elders of the Jews builded. This building here is the same building that Haggai was about. The elders of the Jews, they builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Atazazes, king of Persia. So there had been a commandment given by the Lord, given by Darius, given by Cyrus, and given by Atazazes, yet... The Bible says, despite the commandments that have issued both from the divine and the temporal kings, the, the circuit for prosperity was not complete without the impute of the prophetic ministers that brought a, a ministry unto the men and women that were supposed to carry out the practical aspect of the obedience that was required in order to actualize the temple. So that the Bible says these elders, the people that built it, they prospered. In the building project, they prosper through the prophesying. That there's such a thing as pros pro prospering through prophecy. Now, this is one of the areas that in our world, where a lot of things have been bastardized, this is one of the things that 
a lot of charlatans take advantage of in order to make merchandise of God's people and to exert undue influence over the flock that God has bought with his own blood. But the aberration and the abuse does not negate the place for the right use of such a protocol. That there is an input that the ministers of the Lord, they bring into a project that has been sanctioned by God and that has been commissioned by government. That was what was going on here. The king had commissioned this project. God had initiated the project, yet this project prospered through the prophesying of these prophets. And the prophets in context were Haggai, whose book we are looking at currently, and Zechariah. Remember, it was Zechariah that also kept bringing encouragement to Zerubbabel and at some point would say to Zerubbabel, see, this is what the Lord is saying. Who are you, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? And all of that, and it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. All of that was prophetic impute that was being brought onto a people that have received uh, the commission and the sanction of both God and the ethnic kings of their time. The point of this is to say that there is an impute that needs to come into our lives and that is part of the reason we gather like this because even the work that the Lord has called you to do, there is a certain impute that you require in the course of the execution of that work that is going to come through the ministries that God has set within the body. Has it happened to you before that there were certain things the Lord had said to you personally and you have tried it for a while and then you are beginning to be discouraged by reason of maybe the fact that things were not picking up as fast and as quickly as you expected on the field of ministry and then you attended a meeting or a conference or you listened to a sermon and as you listened to that sermon it was as if multivitamins was being administered to your spiritual structure that you 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 had a renewal and sometimes you have bouts and bouts by bouts and bouts, I'm talking about multiple peaks. It's as if it's overwhelming you, and then after a while, it comes again, and after a while, you are you are you are you are exposed to seasons of torrents and torrents and torrents of refreshing, even in the course of one sermon. So much so that at the end of that of that message, every iota of discouragement vaporizes from your system. It was not because you were being discouraged because you didn't believe God sent you to do what God sent you to do. That wasn't why you were being discouraged. You were being discouraged because in the crucible of life, things happen. And it is part of the economy of sustenance that God has built into the ecosystem of Zion that prophets arise to bring compliment, to bring support to the people of God in the course of the execution of the purposes of God. We may be happy if there was no need for such an impute, but we don't call the shot. The God who is the owner of the show, this is the way he has designed for it to run. And if you are not willing to comply with the protocol of his majesty, then you can set up your own alternative system and see how far that takes you. And so in the course of the year, the point of this, uh, of this instruction is that in the course of the year, it's important that you set your ears. You set your ears in order to receive ministry because it's, it wasn't just enough that they heard the word of the Lord. Why are you not building my house? Get about and get going. And then the people began. But when the people began, God came again by the prophet to begin to bring encouragement. And the encouragement was to answer some of the questions and the murmurings that were rising in their heart. This work that we are doing, so even the elders, you know, they have told us that this building is not really like, it's massive like that. Too. The one they did in the days of Solomon, you know, was better than this. So why are we even slaving on top of this building like this? What's the whole point of doing this thing? How can we be doing something today now that is less than something that they did years ago? Are we not supposed to be going forward instead of going backwards? There were all kinds of things going on in the hearts of the people. And God picked the quiet thoughts and the murmurs, the quiet agitations of their hearts and he sent his prophet to the same people again. One month into the building. So some of you maybe one month into the year, two months into the year, six months into the year, you might need more impute to keep you steadied on the course that you have already set out to pursue. 
and there is nothing new and there's nothing wrong about it. It is something that God understands that is almost inevitable given the burden of our mortality. And in advance, God has made a provision within the body in order to deal with such eventualities any day that they do arise. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. And this is why it's very important. If I have the time, I'll get there. This is why it's very important what your ears hear and what your eyes see. It is not helpful to begin on this kind of a note and then continue on a contaminated note. And when I talk of a contaminated note, I'm talking about contaminating your well in the spirit. Do not contaminate your well in the spirit. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. You see, um, Apostle Mike was saying that somebody can say something that is right and still miss eternal reward because he didn't do the, the thing in the path of righteousness. And I don't know if it was a prayer point here. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but I know there's been that prayer point recently, and it is a prayer point you should pray consistently. The spirit of discernment has been at an all-time low in the body of Christ in our day so that a lot of people cannot tell the holy things apart from the accursed things. And because of that, there's contamination. And the fact that you are sincere does not neutralize contamination. If you drink poison without knowing that it is poison, it is still going to score to your intestine. The, the fact that you didn't know that it was poison does not in any way reduce its potency. All right? It, it does not diminish the intensity of the venom that is loaded therein. So the fact that you don't know that this is poison because it looked like the real deal and you consumed it, that does not let you off the hook. So there are so many people that because of this kind of spiritual combined service that they do, they seemingly give God a bad name. It looks as if the portion that they are receiving is not effective. The reason why it seems it is not effective is because they have taken the right thing, but then they have also mingled it with the wrong thing, all right? And so you have a contaminated well, and then they worry and they are surprised that they are constipated. So I'm saying to you that God will bring you encouragement as you go along. God will bring you reminders as you go along. God will bring you measures as you go along. But you must make sure that your ears are attuned to the right frequencies. Fight contamination as much as you can. Again, he that has ears, let him hear. And so when Haggai brought that word in the seventh month, which was a word of encouragement, God was already sending Haggai to bring answers to questions that were in the hearts of the people that they had not even expressed. Or maybe they have expressed in little corners. And God said, how many of you that saw the former temple, when you look at this one now, in comparison, does this not look like nothing? And you can imagine people were nodding their eyes. Hey, okay, so you are thinking the same thing we are thinking. But the next thing that the Lord said was, yet, yet, now, be strong. Yet, now, be strong. That is, even though this temple looks like nothing compared with the previous one, yet, now, be strong. This may not look like it. But you have not heard well until you have heard from God. When you do the permutation by the observation of the human eyes, the answers are very obvious. And that was why the elders, you cannot completely blame them when they wept the way they wept. Because if all you have are the, are the mortal eyes, your conclusion is not going to be different from theirs. The temple of Solomon was more grand. The grandeur of that temple far exceeded anything that these uh, Jewish people were trying to do in the days of Ezra and Haggai and the rest of them. Obviously. But when the Lord came, the Lord said, even me, I'm aware that this temple looks like nothing compared with the other one. Yet, now be strong. Yet, now be strong. 
And because my journey is a bit far tonight, I don't want to dwell here for too long. But he says, be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek. Oh, be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and walk. That means this looks like nothing in comparison with the other one. Yet, be strong and walk. Why? For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, verse 5, let's read down. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not. This is where the matter starts to become very, very, very sensitive. Because the men that the Lord was speaking to here through here, guy, these men were not part of the actual company of the Israelites that left Egypt. Do you know how long ago Israel left Egypt? But God is speaking to them on the basis of that covenantal agreement that he made with Israel as a corporate people. And he was saying to these people that you are in the line of the inheritors of the covenant commitment that I made to your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So that sometimes it will be very important for you to go backwards in order to frame your advance. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the weapons that you need, some of the totems for advance might be domiciled in some of the interactions that you have had with the Lord in the past. But these interactions were interactions that were had by a federal cooperation in the spirit. There's, there's, there's the... How do I explain this? All right. It, it is that Israel were descendants of the men and women that left Egypt and when God came to them and God was making a commitment to them, that commitment was not just for the immediate people that he made it to. So when the Lord started to say to us, as we got into this year that I'm sending you, I'm causing you to reap in fields that you did not bestow labor. All right? It is not for nothing that God is speaking on that wise. And I want to take a little time to explain that to you. Because some of the things that God is bringing to us in the course of this season that we have entered, they are not just the result of the labors that we have bestowed. This is because we are at the intersect where the timings of God now overlaps with the calendar of men. And the human beings that happen to be caught at that intersect now become the beneficiary of the harvest that has now arrived. It is the result of the culmination of a cumulative process and progress that God began. The prophecies of God over Africa, the prophecies of God over Nigeria, and the totems that were delivered to our fathers, many of whom longed to see the day and they didn't see it until they crossed to yonder. The Lord God said to a people, according to the word that I covenanted with you when I brought you out of captivity, so... My spirit is with you. That means that the presence of the, of, of the spirit of God in the midst of the people at such a time as this is in keeping with covenants that predate the people. That God is asking us to enter into inheritances. Inheritances that the groundwork and the framework was laid before you and I were born. And if we are entering into such a season... It is a season that must be entered with every weight and sense of responsibility that you are capable of mustering. Because the fathers and the mothers, the matriarchs and the patriarchs of Zion that labored in order to make infrastructure available that can carry such a day, they watch us from the grandstand. They are part of the cloud of witnesses. And in a manner of speaking, I can imagine that they are watching to see how we are going to steward the result of their labors because we are the men and the women upon whom the ends of the ages come. And every time that God does that, the generation that is the recipient of this dimension of the workings of God is a generation that is privileged because this is privilege. Are you with me? It's privilege. It happens both in light and in darkness. It happens for good and for ill. The reverse of it is like what God said to Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter, 6, chapter 15. 
that your children, your descendants, they are going to be slaves in a foreign nation. And the land into, whom they are going to, into which they are going to go will oppress them for four generations. But after four generations, I'm going to visit them and bring them out because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God was saying, even though the land of Canaan is the land I promised to give to you, I cannot hand it over to you now. Because if I did that now, I will be violating the dictates and the demands of justice, judgment, and equity. These people that dwell in the land, they are filling the cup of iniquity, of their iniquity. But it is not yet full, such that I can bring complete judgment upon the land. Therefore, I'm going to send your descendants into another land so that the Amorites can continue in this land piling iniquity upon iniquity upon iniquity upon iniquity until by the scales of justice, they now deserve extermination. And that's going to take 400 years. When the 400 years are accomplished and now they now deserve to be exterminated from the face of the earth, then I will go and bring your descendants from that country wherein they have sojourned for 400 years. The descendants of the Amorites in whose day the cup of Amorite will be full, they will not be the ones responsible for the content of that cup as a whole. But they are the recipient. They are the ones that were caught in the intersect between the filling of that cup and the judgment that must now come. Jesus said the same thing. When he saw the activities of the Pharisees, he said, your fathers killed the prophets and you built their sepulcher. And that all of this has happened so that from the blood of righteous Abel unto that other man that was killed between the porch and the altar, that it might be required now at the hand of this generation. There was a cumulative picture in what Jesus was saying that it's come to a head now in your generation. Now, while that happens in darkness or while that happens for ill, I'm saying that the same is true in light. That you can be at the receiving end of the culmination, at the receiving end of the overflow of something that has been building for three millennia. Of something that has been building for five centuries. That it could be that your measure was what eventually got the cup to overflow. But if your measure was all that there was, it would have been less than a drop in the bottom of that cup. But because of the labors of generations and generations and generations before you, we are simply privileged that God is handing over to us a season of the fulfillment of commitments that he made to our fathers. And if these things be so, what manner of men ought we to be? What manner of persons ought we to be? That you know that what is going to go to waste is not only the prayers you prayed. That's not the only thing that will go to waste. If you, if you disappoint God, God is handing over to us the result of a cumulative labor Saints, martyrs, and prophets, men and women that have hazarded their lives, and many of them paid the price of blood, but the cup was being filled and being filled. And they came and went. They looked, they looked, but they didn't see it. And they went over to the other side. And we coming long behind them. And now they People, a generation in a long succession of generation of God seekers. This thing did not begin in our time. If you are going to understand everything that God is going to release to us, you cannot look at only everything that we have done. No. No. And so God began to say that in this season... One of the needs that the church has is need for messengers of the Lord in the Lord's message. Like hey guy, people that can bring periodic, periodic perspective, periodic broadcast from heaven, progress report, encouragement, exhortation, so as to strengthen the hands of the builders. 
and to equip the laborers as the need might be to bring clarity where there is doubt and to dispel any kind of question that may arise in the heart of people to sap vital energy that should be deployed in the direction of the work. And so Haggai brought the word of the Lord again. So what you see in Haggai chapter 2 is the prophet of the Lord bringing the word of the Lord to the builders in the course of building. This was not when the project began. They had worked for one month and then God sent Haggai again say, okay, uh, go and talk to them in this wise. And he now said, according to that promise that I made with you when I brought you out of the land of Egypt, my spirit is with you. Every time God does this, sometimes it can be very difficult to understand because if you do not know what is going on at the back end, you might think that God is being unfair at the front end. How can you give so much to such a little boy? You may not know. But if the little boy is an attentive, an attentive follower of the God of his ordination, he would have heard things in the secret place that would permanently sober him and perpetually keep him in the place of humility. Because when God came to, you see, when God came to Moses, God said to Moses, the people, my people that are in Egypt are, are suffering and the taskmaster is laying a heavy burden upon them. I have heard their cry. I have seen their trouble. Their tears, their cries have ascended into my ear and I have come down now to deliver them. Then the next thing was very confusing. He said, therefore, come. It was not the intercession of Moses that God heard. It was the cry of a people in Egypt that God heard. But here was God in another country bringing encounter to a man that the last time that man attempted to do anything in the direction of this problem God wants to solve was 40 years ago. Moses was the kind of man that had given up on the liberation of Israel, at least in his own lifetime. And he did that with every sense of confidence and self-justification. If you talk to Moses about that liberation movement, he will say, I have tried my best. In fact, if you have done half of what I have done to secure the release of Israel, then you can come and have this conversation with me. Ah, what did you do? He said, I killed an Egyptian for the sake of those people. Once upon a time, I killed an Egyptian to deliver an Israelite. It was the same Israelite when I came again to resolve a matter between an Israelite and an Israelite. They were the ones that turned against me and were ready to expose me. It was on account of Israel that I ran out of Egypt. Even God knows that I have tried. That's what Moses would have said. But here was God with this man. And God is saying, I heard the cry of my people in Egypt. That's why I am here in Midian. Because some of the things that will come upon some of us is in response to a cry that had been lifted to God out of Libya. Secret disciples who labored in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and they died. Not having received that which was promised. But the day breaks that God now goes into the ancient archives and the memorials of heaven to pull out things that were dummies and many of them stored in ancient bottles. Because God said, the psalmist said, my tears in prayer, are they not all captured? Are they, are they not collected in your bottle? But the seasons of God needs to collide with the times of men, in order for things to break out, it is called the fullness of time. And that's the intersection that we are caught in. We are in that place that is called the fullness of time. This is where divine timing intersects with the seasons of men. And the men that are on the, men that are on the scene, on the stage at such a time, they become the beneficiary of something that is far in excess of their capacity to labor in terms of procurement. So it's almost an award of grace. It's donated. But what God donates to us is a corporate patrimony of Zion in this part of the world. You know, we were were invited by privilege into 
uh, a very sensitive meeting, Apostle and I, on the first day of the year. And one of the things that sobered me from that place was to hear those elders say that over our land, the cloud of revival gathered twice in their lifetime. That there was a time it gathered, it gathered, it gathered, and it was imminent that there was going to be an outburst. And just as they got to that tipping point, they don't know what happened, and it began to dissipate, and it dissipated. And that after a while, it started gathering again. And it gathered and gathered and gathered and gathered. It got to a tipping point, and before there will be the outbreak, they don't know what happened. It dissipated again. And they said, have you noticed that the same cloud has started to gather over our land again? And everybody nodded. And the question was, what do we do this time? What do we do this time? And I sat there and I shuddered. There are not many generations that have been privileged to see revival gather twice. And they said, we've seen it twice, aborted at its peak, just before it becomes a man-child, aborted twice. And they've had the privilege now that there's a third, uh, there's a third gathering that is happening again. And they ask the question, what do we do this time so that the same abortion does not happen? There's a sense and a spirit of responsibility that must come upon you in this season. That's the point I'm trying to make. God is about to donate something to us, to donate something to us that is in keeping with covenants that predate us according to the words that I covenanted with your fathers, with you when I brought you out of Egypt, so my spirit is with you. And you can say, sir, but uh, Prophet Hagar, we were not there when our father, it was our forefathers that left Egypt, we were not there. Well, God said it's in keeping with the covenant I made with you on that day that I'm here on this day. And so, don't be afraid. Now, part of what this tells you is that in the workings of God and when the seasons of God come, many times you may need to look backwards in order to know how to go forward. You may need to look backwards, to look into the archives of God because the messengers of the Lord in the Lord's message on such a day, they are very specialized Specialized functionaries that God crafts and preserves and present on a day of need. And if the season that you are in is in the same pattern, is after the order of a season that has been before, then you can glean wisdom from that previous season in order to know how to deal with your own current season. Are you with me? Are you with me? And uh, it, this is not new to me. It is, I'm just borrowing the wisdom of scripture. Because Jesus, when he was teaching about the last days, he said, that day is going to be like the days of Noah. And he gave us certain features of the days of Noah that are going to be consistent with the days that he was talking about. So that if you understand the things that happened in the days of Noah, you will be able to superimpose it upon a coming day and you can glean wisdom. Are you with me? He said it will be like the days of Noah. It will be like the days of Lot. The days of Noah, eating, drinking, giving out in marriage, and getting married, and all of that. And they continued like that until the day that Noah stepped into the ark. Now, what does that mean to you? Jesus is saying, in the future, 
It's going to be like the days of Noah. Noah is in the past. So if you go study the days of Noah, it will give you wisdom to be able to discern the times that are ahead of you. In fact, he got to the point, he said, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife died in the book of Genesis. Genesis. And in the book of Matthew, in the book of Luke, Jesus Christ is telling his disciples and listeners to remember Lot's wife. That's to say, there are certain cycles, certain patterns that exist. And if you understand those patterns, you can navigate with greater wisdom, a future season, because that future season is after the pattern of a previous season. Are you with me? I know why I'm going with this. And I said for you to put on your prophetic ears. I'm giving you prophetic instructions. Because those days are upon us. So while it is going on like that, and there are, there are patterns in darkness, there are patterns in decay and corruption that will be the markers of the time. In the same way, there are patterns in light and in righteousness that will be the markers of the time. They will not just be markers, but then they will be the instructional material of God. That when such a day breaks, what kind of people will be able to take the day for God? You look at a pattern in the past and say, on such a day, what kind of people took the day for God? Because if the pattern is going to be repeated in my own time, all right, then it means I can glean wisdom from the men and women who stood for Zion in a previous time. Hello? Are you with me? It gets even more serious because that's where I'm going with this. When God began to talk like that, a point came, God said, there is a day that we break, sir. He said, there is a day that we break, and on that day, I'm going to send my prophet Elijah. I say, uh-uh. Of all the people that you can create, why do you need to bring Elijah from his own generation and time and bring him into a future time? You know that this is, depending on how you, uh, 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 your theological lenses, but you know Elijah was one of those men <laughs> that has not died. Do you know the tomb? Those of you that have been to Jerusalem, have they shown you Elijah's tomb before? He has known. This was one of the men that has not died. The other in that class will be Enoch. And in the book of Malachi, God was speaking about the great day of the Lord. And he says, when that day will come, before that day will come, I will send my servant, Elijah, that he will go before me. All right? And I will say, what, why do you need to send Elijah? Now, this thing I'm saying to you is because a season has come. And we need to glean wisdom from certain patterns in scripture. Because they will guide us, they will provide us a lot of perspective. And they will deliver us from so many errors in our time. When the day of the Lord is about to break, heralds are needed. And right now, the day of the Lord is upon us. The day of the Lord is upon us. That was what God promised in Haggai. His day is upon us. And when the day of the Lord is upon a people, there are functionaries that God sends into the midst of the earth, particularly for his own people, to ready them for the appearing of the thrice holy one of Zion. So you start to see that there is a genre, there's a genre of anointing in the spirit. It's, it's, it's the thing that, that often is called an office. And I'll tell you it's other designations as we go on. That there is a day that is ahead of us. And God has said to us that it is after the day of the Lord. And if it is after the day of the Lord, you need to go into scriptures to find out what does God expect when it is time to make preparation for the day of the Lord. God said, before that day comes, I will send my messenger ahead of me. And in the book of Malachi, 
chapter 4. In Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5. Behold, Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Hello? You know, this is Malachi. In Malachi, Elijah went to heaven in the book of Kings. And God was still talking about Elijah. And he said, and we send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is a prophetic picture that establishes a prophetic protocol that to herald the day of the Lord, there are messengers that are sent. If you believe that you have a part in the coming revival, I want you to listen to me and hear me with the ears of your spirit. God has a set of spiritual array of functionary that are sent to herald the day of the Lord. And they have a particular kind of ministry also. So he said, before that, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the ministry of this Elijah will be a turning ministry. It will be a ministry that turns heart. Because the focus of the ministry, the target of the ministry will be heart. It will be human heart. And the objective will be to turn. Now, the hearts that are in question here, generally, they are the hearts of God's own Israel. Which means that there will be a season of apostasy or at least there will be a season of decline or at least there will be a season of lukewarmness. Pick whichever one works for you. There will be a need to activate, to reactivate, to start up something that the, if the people of God will be lukewarm, will be unconcerned, will be responsible. The people of God would have all gone, every man in his own way. And they will not be aware that their Lord is coming or has come if God does not send a functionary to rouse them. To rouse them. God says that the day of the Lord is at hand, is nigh at hand. And when that day will come, before that day will come, God will send his prophets. God will send messengers. And in this passage, he says, before that day comes, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet. Hallelujah. He said, he was going to send Elijah the prophet. And the ministry of this Elijah will be to turn hearts. It will be to turn hearts. It will be to turn hearts, the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the children to the fathers. Lest I come and I smite the earth with a curse. So, who was this Elijah? You know, in the New Testament, hello? In the New Testament, they came to John the Baptist once upon a time and they asked him, are you the Messiah? He said, no. Jeremiah, no. Are you Elijah? No. Are you that prophet? He also said, no. That prophet. Which prophet is that prophet? The Jews, some of them thought that when Moses said, a prophet like unto me, the Lord your God will send. All right? Uh, some of the Jews don't identify that prophet with the Messiah. And because he does not have any other designation apart from a prophet like unto me, shall the Lord your God send. So he is that prophet. Are you that prophet? Because the Israelites had been anticipating that unique prophet that Moses had talked about. John, are you that prophet? He said, no. So who are you? That we may have something to say to the men that sent us. My point here is, John said, I'm not Elijah. When they asked him. But when Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 11, he said that, what? That John the Baptist was what? Was Elijah. So, 
So in verse 8, but when, when, what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But went you out, what went you out to see? A prophet? Yeah. And I said to you, more than a prophet, for he, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. We shall prepare your way before thee. Verily, I say unto you, of all men that are born of women, there has no reason uh, a greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, it's clearer in chapter 17. In the same Matthew chapter 17. In the same Matthew chapter 17. From verse 9, they just came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew 17 verse 9. And they came down from the mountain. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, Tell this vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come. When Jesus said, Elijah truly shall first come, is that in the past tense or in the future tense? What tense is that? Future tense. Elijah shall truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already. Now, is that, what tense is that? Present or present? All right, present continuous. Present perfect. But I say unto you that Elijah is come how? Already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. So which exactly is it? Is it that Elijah shall first come? Or Elijah has already come? Huh? Which is it? What? You see, that's my problem with people who are always in a hurry to rheumatize. See, you need to understand what the Bible says before you try to extrapolate what it means. What does it say? It says, he, will, he shall surely come. And it says, he has already come. That means, Elijah shall surely come. And that also means, Elijah has already come. Elijah is supposed to herald the ministry of Jesus. Right? Right? Elijah is supposed to come before Jesus comes. So it's not surprising that you are looking at it like that. Because Jesus has two comings. Has Jesus already come? Shall Jesus still come? Yes. Is that a contradiction? No. no. Wait, that's not a place to clap. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm talking to you in prophecy. You are clapping. I'm not doing rema here. I'm trying to grant you perspective. You see, it means that this is a pattern. That there are certain operations of God that if they must happen, there are certain things that God has woven, revealed by a person. All right? Oroko called it a mantle. That God has revealed by a person. Elijah was not just a person. Elijah was an institution in the spirit. There is something that Elijah exemplified. There was something that Elijah, he, he, he did not just manifest. There was something that he embodied. There was something that Elijah incarnated. He did it so well that there is no need to describe that thing by any other thing than Elijah. You know, sometimes out of some kind of uh, 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 good intention, but without proper explanation, we just tell the people, hey, you cannot be saying these are the days of Elijah. Well, Jesus said Elijah is even still ahead. His days are still ahead. 
I didn't write the script, you just read it. That Elijah will still come in the future. Because the thing that necessitated the release of the Elijah anointing, if those same seasons were to crystallize again, God already has a weapon that deals with it. It is called Elijah. And when God needs a day that turning will happen, Elijah is, before Elijah, the turner that we had in scripture was not a person. When you see this ministry happen, it was with Moses. And what God used that day was a bush. When God was trying to turn an entire nation and then to turn their leader first, Moses had gone, he had gone on a trajectory that was outside of ordination for 40 years. The day God was going to turn the man, there was no man God could set ablaze. So God had to use a bush. And when Elijah saw that bush, Elijah said, Ha! Ah, what is this great sight? Let me now turn and see. Why this bush burns and is not consumed. And when Elijah turned, the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, when Moses turned, I mean. When Moses turned at the burning bush, he had that encounter and the rest now is history. Any day that God wants to turn a people, there is something that God releases to carry on that function. So, when Elijah showed up on the scene, Elijah was a turner. Israel had gone into sin. They had abandoned the Lord. And Elijah came. That was how we, he was introduced to us. Elijah the Tishbite. There shall be neither rain nor dew except by my word. And that was the protocol for turning. He was trying to turn a nation that had turned from God. He was trying to turn them back to the Lord. And after about three and a half years, God said, okay, now go and show yourself. I will send the rain. On the day that Elijah's contest happened on the Mount of Camel, when Elijah was about to pray before the fire would descend, in 1 Kings chapter 18, about verse 35, the Bible says when Elijah had set everything at the altars in place with the 12 stones and had asked for water and water and water, in verse 36, give me verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came nigh and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of, I, of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done these things at your word. Verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God that has torn their hearts, what? Back again. So when you look at Malachi and the Lord said, before I will arrive, I will send my servant, what? The prophet who? Elijah. What will be his ministry? He will turn hearts. It is something that finally rested upon a man. And from that day, the thing is now branded after the man. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm saying that in this year, this season that we have entered, as we prepare for what is about to come, there are graces, there are anointings that God will be releasing into the earth again. I'm talking of radical toner anointings. If you think these are the days of Elijah, in this season you will not be wrong. Because the days of Elijah are even still ahead. If there is a situation that needs a remedy and God releases the remedy and solves the problem, when that situation arrives again, we already know the remedy. In this case, God just goes back and brings the remedy. When there is need to turn hearts back to God, this is what God does. So in Malachi, when he said he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, in the book of Luke chapter 1, in Luke chapter 1 verse 14, give me Luke chapter 1 verse 14. When the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and 
He's bringing the news of the birth of John the Baptist. He said, you will have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. Verse 15. We're going all the way to 17. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. These are all prophetic instructions for this season. People that are great in God's sight. People that are great. Where? In God's sight. Greatness in the sight of the Lord. That whatever your rating and ranking is among men will not be important for the execution of the season that is about to come upon us. It is the men and women that their greatness is, is attested to by the Lord. That in God's presence, they are recognized. People like Zechariah, the prophet, that when the day broke for the mercy that God will show to Joshua the high priest, and they are saying, take off the filthy garments from Joshua. And they took it off. The man, the prophet, Zechariah, also said, put a fair meter upon his head. Uh-uh. This thing was not happening in the temple in Jerusalem. It was happening in the court of heaven. Zechariah was such a man that could make impute into the outcome of a court session in heaven. And he was not just there as a witness. He was there as a principal facilitator. There was something that Joshua wore in the spirit that was because the prophet Zechariah spoke. It was Zechariah that said, this is garment. He also needs a crown on his head. Put a fair meter. And the men that served in the court, nobody opposed. When they saw who was talking, ah, if it's Zechariah, they just obeyed. I'm talking of greatness in the sight of the Lord. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. You know, I was going to talk to you about three things. Your consecration, your character, and your company. Because they'll be important in this season. I'm not going to teach it. You can already see it. Your consecration, your character, and your company. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. All right? He will be great in the sight of the Lord and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. That means there is something that is forbidden that he will not do. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So there is something that is forbidden and there is something that is guaranteed or granted or promised. So God said, wine and strong drink will not come into this vessel. But the Holy Ghost will come into this vessel. He shall not drink wine nor strong drink. That was his consecration. And the reason I separated consecration from character is because they are not exactly the same things. But your consecration will affect your character. And your character will affect your consecration. But they are not exactly the same things. Because there are certain things that God requires of you simply because of the genre of the anointing that is releasing upon you. It's not because the thing is objectively sinful. Are you with me? That's part of consecration. That one is part of consecration. We can teach the normal Christian character life of a disciple. A disciple should not do this, should not do that. And then we teach in an atmosphere of grace. And grace comes into your life to enable you. That's Christ-likeness. But what I'm talking about is something that fashions you after the order of your ordination. It's, it's your uniqueness in the spirit. It's your consecration. Some other persons can take wine. Some other persons can, can take strong drink. But he shall not take wine no strong drink. And this is the year because God is trying to craft specialized war instrument. It's a year of heavy consecrations that will be laid upon God's people. It will so happen that in your workplace, it, will, it, it would have become second nature. Everybody now knows that that break period, there is a 20 minutes in that break period that you cannot see her. And it's like, you, you are not the only person that goes to church. This is your prayer break that you're always taking. You know now that you don't need a 20 minutes prayer break to go to heaven. But it is a consecration. Your life in your ordination depends 
on the keeping of that 20 minute appointment with the Lord in the midst of your break period. And therefore, you are not going to be looking down on the other believers in your office who use their entire break for break. Because it's not a sin to use your break as break. But if God has said to you that 20 minutes of your break belongs to me, to you, it becomes a sin. Because that's a matter of consecration. They said of John, he will not drink wine. He will not take strong drink. Do you have consecrations? I want to say to you that the ones you threw away before, you need to revive them because God is bringing more. There's a season coming upon us as God's corporate people where God intends that our distinguishing factor can only be accounted for in the spirit. Your consecration will become a critical matter in this day. These are not the days when people are still asking, where does the Bible say you should not take alcohol? Where does the Bible say you cannot uh, have more than one wife? If you are still there, you are out of date. We, we left there a long time ago. A long time ago. If you are still among them that you say, eh, but even this gay thing we are talking about, but if that's the way God made somebody, eh, should we? Sir, you are, your journey is far. You, the, you, the train has left you behind. We have gone past the level of Christian character and morality. We are talking of consecrations now. We are no longer trying to say what is right, what is wrong. We, we, that was what we did all these years. The days of our lives are upon us. And now we must begin to look at the nitty gritty, the minute things of our ordinations. The things that will be okay for one, but will be anathema for the other. And if at the level of Christian morality, we are still arguing, when are we going to start talking of consecrations for ordinations? There are things forbidden. But then there were things promised. He will not do this. But he will have this. He will not drink wine or strong drink. But he will be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he what? Mm -hmm. Shall he turn. This, this is where we are going. Because this is what God wants to do again. Is this turning ministry? Because he that will come will come. And he will not tarry. But before he comes, there's a generation that heralds his coming in majesty. It is a turner generation. And upon that generation, God lays consecrations. Upon that generation, God lays obligation. Upon that generation, God brings prescription out of the heavens. That are not in keeping with the day. If you are a man of your time, you are already out of order. John was not. Elijah before him was not. The burning bush of Moses was not. Bush don't burn without being consumed. That's a departure from the reality of bush, of shrubs. Every toner, every toner in their time, we are not products of their time. You could not even tie them to their day. There was a uniqueness. Their identity and their function, it came out of the same place from which their oil came. And that oil comes with a sense, a set of impositions, consecrations, demands, speakings, and ordinances and statutes. You know in my place, if there is a remedy for scorpion sting, that if they are to give you there are certain conditions. There are bylaws. They will say, this portion, if we give you this portion, if it's going to remain potent when you administer it, there are things you can no longer do. One of them is, you can no longer sit on a stone. Don't ask me how they are connected. <laughs> but they say, from today henceforth, you can no longer put your bomb on a stone. You can't sit on a stone. That's one. Number two, they will say from today onwards, you can no longer eat directly from a pot. 
if this portion will continue to work. The people know that it's not, it's not a taboo normally to eat out of a pot. And it's not a taboo normally to sit on a stone. But for the portion to cure scorpion sting that we are about to give you, if it must work, this thing that is not a taboo, we have to become a taboo. So if you are still there and you are an occasional fornicator and you are saying, but it's not as bad as 2018 again. You, you, are, you are far behind. We have left the level of, eh, you know, what is right, what is wrong. We are talking of consecrations now. Consecrations that are ordination specific. These are the days that men must shine after the colors of their ordination than after the fashion of the day. That when people look at you, you will resemble something in the spirit. Physically like this. They look at you. They say, we don't understand where this man came from. Because when Elijah stood that day and said, go back to the palace and tell the king, is that because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to consort of Ekron? You will die on that bed. You will not come down from that bed of affliction. The men went back to the palace. And the king said, why are you back so soon? They said, one man stopped us. And said, you will die. Is it because there is no God in Israel? Who is the man? Who is sending back a presidential convoy? Who is such a man? One man. We are talking of a turner. It was a turn. He, he, he sent them back. One man. What does one man say to a presidential convoy? That the convoy will turn. Do, do you think it was the, the muscles of his biceps? No. There was something that rested on the man. And it was a complete package. The man embodied it to the point that hundreds of years later, they still called that anointing by the man. So the king said, who is the man? They said, sir, we were too scared to ask his name. But uh, the thing he was wearing was also odd. He had one garment like that. And then a leather giddle around his way. Ah! That must be Elijah the Tishbite. That tells you that Elijah's dress pattern was not consistent with the fashion of his day. Because if I tell you, somebody send me back. You say, who is the person? I say, well, the man was wearing kaftan. In this man, even in this hall now. Do you know how many people are wearing kaftan in this hall? You cannot use somebody's dressing to identify the person if his dressing is commonplace. I'm talking of consecrations. So you are sitting here telling us, what took your eyes there? We say, sister, can you not dress a bit more decently? You say, what took your eyes there? <laughs> to the pure, all things are pure. You see, you, you, you will languish in a dry place. Your journey is far. If you are still at the level of, is it a sin? Is it not a sin? We, we left there. You are late. Oh. We left there in 2015. Eh? We left that place in 2015. You know the IEC of 2015? That was when we left the place. And something has been building, arriving at a crescendo. And you are still here dragging with slay queens. The man's dressing was informed by the man's anointing. How do I know? It was not just that day. Not just that day. When John the Baptist showed up, they said, John too had a garment like that. And he had a leather giddle around his waist. And like Elijah before him, he was in the wilderness. It didn't just affect his fashion, it affected his diet. You know that ordinarily, Elijah, uh, uh, John the Baptist was entitled to the fat of ram and the sacrifices of the Lord because by biology, he had the right to the offerings of the Lord in the temple. But there was something that was stronger than his biological privileges. It was that oil. The thing constrained him John was not in the temple. He was in the wilderness. 
the things he was entitled to were not the things he ate. The things he ate was after his ordination. I'm saying that what is about to come, if you make your neck available, it will regiment your life. But therein will be the beauty of the fire. If you are playing games, you are late. You, many of you need to do catch up tonight. And come up to speed with where the Lord is at. You are still making life. There's somebody watching us online. You are still making life difficult for your husband. And you are doing it intentionally. Intentionally. You are taking advantage of the convictions of your husband to punish him. Say, I know he's a good man. So let me show him. I know what can he do to me? He can't do me anything. It's a wicked heart. And the Lord is asking me to ask you to repent because you are about to miss your measure. These are the days of work. We, we, there is no time. There is no time. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. So, the man came after the order of Elijah. But he was not after the flesh of Elijah. When they asked him, are you Elijah? They were asking if he was something of the incarnate Elijah. Because when God said, I will send my servant Elijah, Jesus said, Elijah shall come. And Elijah has come. Are you with me? In what sense shall Elijah come? And in what sense has Elijah come? At least we can answer the one that concerns us. In what sense has he come? The next verse tells us in Luke chapter 1 verse 17, which is where we pray. And he shall go. That's the John the Baptist being promised. He shall what? He shall go before him. How? In the spirit and power, not in the body of Elijah. He shall go before him. How? In the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for their God. You see, God is raising, let's call it, turner ministries. Because he that will come will come. And any time that he is about to come, turner ministries are required. That in that your office, huh, you will become the impediment to the advance of iniquity. An official wickedness. The man that subvert the destinies of the poor by a stroke of the pen, you will become the turner in the day of the Lord. That when you begin your ministry, it will be obvious that man, something is as if things are changing. That was John the Baptist's ministry. That was Elijah's ministry to turn people to the Lord their God. And when there was a need again to turn people to the Lord, there was no need to invent any new... God just simply went back into the archives. That thing that Elijah wore, they brought it back out of the archives. And they wore it for another man. That man was John the Baptist. But they came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So you saw that that anointing regulated his life. Even his predicaments were after the order of the anointing. And I'll tell you that finally and then we pray. You saw the way that Jezebel haunted Elijah before John. That was the same way that Herodias haunted John. They, there, was, there was always something with the authorities and the powers that be. And the Jezebelic spirit. Jezebelic spirit is very, very attracted to the Elijah mantle. And if it cannot be attached to it, it will attack it. The spirit of seduction. We, we are going to come up against it, it, it because it comes with the mantle of this season. If you have not heard, hear me now. I, I said, put on your prophetic ears because you think I'm teaching the Bible. I'm reading out of the scrolls of the season. This, this forerunning ministry for he that is about to come, it, Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel is attracted to it. 
And because Jezebel cannot be attached to it, Jezebel will attack it. As fiery as Elijah was, he ran before Jezebel. As terrific as John was, it was Herodias that put him in jail. And in the end, he took the head of John the Baptist. The thing that attacked the carrier of that mandate and mantle before him was attacked by the queen. When the next person carried the same thing, the same office attacked him. So if you want to be with God in this season, you need to get ready for the backlash of Jezebel. And many, many, because you know, there was Jezebel and there's Jezebel. In the book of Revelation, Jezebel had also become an institution. And God began to speak. I gave her time to repent. And she will know. So we cast her and her children upon a bed of affliction. Jezebel. That you would have thought died a long time ago. Jezebel. Jezebel. He, she, she exemplified and embodied a demonic mantle to the point that that mantle was memorialized in her name. They, they changed the name in the spirit. Say, madam, you wore it very well. They just branded it after her. So, hey, any day that Satan wants to release that, he says, where's Jezebel? It's not biological Jezebel anymore. It is now an office in witch, witchcraft. It's an office in darkness. The same way that Elijah has become an institution in the spirit. That's what Jezebel became. And listen to me, people of God. If you want to stand in these days, you need to learn anti-Jezebel technologies because hmm, you think that all the prophets of Baal that Jezebel was feeding, you think they all started as prophets of Baal? You will need to learn how to put a knife to your truth. And tie a giddle on your appetite. Huh? And put a sieve to your eyes. And let that eye be single. Because if the forerunner's anointing when it comes, it attracts Jezebel. Jezebel will test it, try it, attack it. And will even try to take it out. And so, what manner of men ought we to be? If this is our ordination. He shall go. Let me hear you say he shall go. This is how we are going to go from this mountain. How? He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. The, that is a designation of an attire. An attire. He's going to go. This is a mandate. He will go. He will go before the Lord. But what will he go before the Lord in? It will be in the spirit and power of Elijah. When they say spirit and power of Elijah, it's now clear why John told the Jews that I'm not Elijah because I've not come in the body of Elijah. And you know, there are Bible scholars that will therefore tell you that one of the two witnesses of the book of Revelation that we walk this street will be Elijah because Elijah is one man that has still not yet died. That has not died. And it is appointed unto men to die but once. If Elijah will come in his body. He will come in his body. But there is the spirit and power of Elijah. He is a genre of ordination and anointing. That turns a generation. That has turned his back on God. Back to God. There is a compelling anointing. There is a grace that compels compliance with the dictates and edicts out of Zion where people can no longer claim to not be touched by the verities of the kingdom. That the things people used to hear and say, well, 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 I think about it, I think about it. All right? People will no longer be indifferent to the offerings of this anointing. You will either embrace it or you will fight it. You can't sit on the fence. 
That is what God is releasing upon the church in this day. And it is not just that he's going to come in the preaching of Elijah. No, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Let me hear you say spirit and power. That's the garment that God wants for us to wear in this season. It, it is our corporate lot. And God may be speaking to you particularly. But I'm talking to you as a corporate people. That the toner generation is this generation. God intends that the forgotten, the, the forgotten principles and priorities of the kingdom. That are about to be lost. That people will be awoken. Revived again. And that the worship and the service of God once again will become the normal practice in our nations. That where was Jesus was king again. Jesus will be king. The same way that Israel went after Baal. And they went out warring for many years. Until Elijah showed up. And on that day when their hearts were practically turned. They now cried. The Lord he is God. The Lord he is God. They sang songs that they were not taught. Because it was now the day of the Lord. And that day of the Lord broke by the hand of a toner, a toner anointing. That you will go from here and as you go to your place of work, it is not that you are going in the preaching and speaking of Elijah. No, it is in the spirit and power that your life will exude a compelling aura that people will be forced, will be forced to start to make adjustment even before you start to talk. That people will start to change the subject of conversation. When they sense you coming anywhere close. All of you that have been in your office and I say, well, I'm a Christian, but my own is not like that. You see, he, 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 you are late. The time to wear the colors of Zion is now. Because he that will come will come. We will see some of the most outrageous, outstanding, terrific miracles that has ever been witnessed by any generation. It is a spirit and power of Elijah. This was where I have a problem with John. Because John indeed went in the spirit of Elijah. But he did not maximize his power. Unfortunately in our day, many people want to go in the power without the spirit. There is a spirit and power of Elijah. There is a manner. When, when Elijah got the, the mantle of Elijah, he didn't ask for mantle. He didn't ask for anointing. He asked for spirit. What do you want me to do for you? He said, a double portion of your spirit, not of your anointing, spirit. And so when he came out from Jordan, from the other side, the sons of the prophet, when they saw him afar, they said, ah, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. Let me hear you say spirit and power. Don't just run after the power without the spirit. And don't embrace the spirit without the power. If God says you need a combination. And it has to be spirit and power. Sir, that's what you must go for. And God is not saying that as something he puts in our hand. He's saying that as something we wear. He will go before him in. Huh? You are, we are not going in Agbada. We are going in the spirit and power of Elijah. Your blouse will not be the most iconic thing that you bring to the table. Are you with me? It will not be the three-piece suit. No, it will be the spirit and power of the toner. And you know tonight, the spirit and power that is consistent with your particular ordination is what you will go in. So there will have to be mobility. He will go. He will go. For he will go in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that spirit and that power, God will dress men and women. Hello? Uh, the functionaries of his majesty are lined up because there's going to be a change of wardrobe tonight. Men are about to be attired in garments that are made in heaven. You, you, you know, you wear... Nike, you wear Tom Hilfiger, and whatever the designers are. Huh? You are about to wear something that was designed, that was sown in heaven. And some of the things God is about to release 
It's been a long time ago. It's been a long time ago that the Lord graced the earth with that genre, with that, that combination of the composite that is required because in our day, there are mountains of devils that we need to confront. And because every generation has its own perversion, God will release anointings that are consistent with the perversions of a generation. If we are going to speak to men that are steeped in wickedness and by wizardry and necromancy, they conjure all kinds of spirit in order to cast a spell upon the minds of people. You must have the turning capacity that dispels that thing that the devil cast over the minds of people so that the glorious light of the gospel can beam upon that light and they can turn again to the one that made them in the first place. You say the West, they've gone too far. No. No, there's a spirit and power. That even Ahab will not be able to ignore. He will not be indifferent to it. You, you will speak at first and it will look at, it's not today we started hearing these things. That was why they allowed Elijah go. If Ahab had taken Elijah's word seriously, the first day Elijah spoke, they would not have allowed him to leave. When he said, as long as the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be neither rain nor dew except by my word. Huh. He left. If you knew that was going to happen, would you have let him go if you were the king? It was uh -uh, six months. Eight months. No deal, no rain. Ten months. No deal, no rain. Uh, the palace guards that were with the king started murmuring behind. First, say, Could it be what that uh, rugged man said that day that is trying to happen here? W what was going on? After about one year, even the king got on board and said, I, I know what people are thinking. I'm thinking it too. Can you find that Elijah for me? That was when they started looking for the man. There were not many people the day the man spoke. Huh? It was only a matter of time. Even goats felt the impact of his prophecy. <laughs> Let me hear you say spirit and power. Spirit and power. That is the dressing that we will wear out of this mountain into this year. It will be something that is consistent with the, the, the errors that God has called you to confront and the mantles that God has called you to crush. That when you stand before it, it will bow before that which you carry. That some of you, when you go back from this place, literally your friends and colleagues, they will say something happened to you. Because the thing that is coming upon you, the dressing that you are about to be dressed with, anyone that has eyes that can see, we see. It will no longer be business as usual. Men will no longer have the capacity to resist or gainsay the things that will proceed out of your vessel. For God will give you a mouth and a wisdom. It is the spirit and the power that is consistent with your own ordination. Listen to me, people of God. The seasons have come upon us. And the things that God has reserved for millennia, for eons, God will now open the ancient chest, ancient wardrobes in the heaven. Because men and women on a day like this must be coronated. There will be apparels, there will be togas of grace that God wears for people. Men, that the word of God in their mouth will be law. People, that when they speak, the heavens and the earth will stand at attention. It is a spirit and it's the power of the turner. We are the eternal generation. We are the eternal generation. And there is a clothing that is coming out of the heaven. Made in heaven. Sown in heaven. God will wear for men and for women attires, togas that is called spirit and power. The spirit will forge you in your consecration, it will forge you in your character, and the power will forge you in the charismatics. 
Akebe kapanata skibelatwa. Alimina kapata soko penata. Ebrene teskobe. De toma. De toma. In every office. On every campus. In every lecture room. A toma. For every street. tonight until the spirit be poured upon us can you pray the next three minutes can you pray in the next three minutes because he that will come he is upon us he is upon us upon us Until the spirit, until the spirit, Elimine Sosobe, Arina Sisa Labarata Skabalamba, reach out to God for your own equipping. Is my talker? Where is my comment for the season? Ana sababa taski. Anini se seleba. Abe paratas. Ebre teteski. So Samaratas Ebritis Abara Ebene Kabana Tua Sasa Abritia Sasa Bratatabra Nakapatas Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Until the spirit be poured. Aradadadashadadadadaba, Patina Kapotata Arabana 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 Katwa Aipana Kasala Prana Ekene Ketuna Kasesala Abina Sabarati He is upon us Every 